Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. And guys, I know the audio might not be as good as it was before, but that's just because of all the audio and video issues that we've had. But hey, we finally connected. We have bodybuilding legend Nancy Lewis on the podcast. I mean, there's few people that I've gotten more recommendations for, and you know, it's an honor and privilege to have her on. And I'm just going to list her stats out right here, right before we even introduce her, everyone, just so that you can know that I'm talking to truly one of the legends of the sport. Her first bodybuilding show was in 1985. She won her pro card in 91, which is three years before I was born. And uh, she retired in 1998 and then came back in 2002. And she won the overall at the Jan Tana Classic that year. And her last show was in 2012. And she was at the Olympia seven times. So she has quite the resume. But most importantly, she's on here to just share her journey and discuss what she's been up to since then and basically everything. But most importantly, Nancy, thank you so much for coming on. You're quite welcome, and thank you for having me. And I do want to say thank you for all the other ladies who suggested, you know, that you and I reach out and get together and have this conversation. Absolutely. I mean, that's half the guests that I get on too is just from recommendations from others, like, oh, you should go follow her and you should go have her on. So yeah, I really do appreciate that. But I mean, I don't even know where to start because you've had such a career in the sport. So to get things started, why don't you start off with your backstory and how you got started working out and how that led to your career in bodybuilding. So believe it or not, bodybuilding was something I never wanted to do. I have been an athlete since the age of 11. Uh, The age of 11, I went into the Junior Olympics, won the um, bronze medal in the, by then it was the uh, 440. Now it's the four by, yeah, the four by 100. And from that, I went into gymnastics. I was in gymnastics for several years up until my college years. So there was a point in time in my life where I started to change. I started to mature. I was no longer 110 pounds. I went up to 112, 115, 116. And I just felt that it was inconvenient for me. I was bigger. I was maturing. And I also felt that my coaches really couldn't spot me, like for those double backs, those in and outs. Right. So probably my sophomore year in college, I said, you know what? I need to do something else. My body's all out of whack. I'm not able to do the tricks that I was before. And a good friend of mine uh, named Wayne, he says, well, Nancy, why don't you go and start training in the gym? And I told him, I said, I don't know anything about the gym. And he said, well, get a book. And so I got a book by Laura Cones. And the first gym I joined was Jardines, which was in San Leandro, California. I want to say I am definitely a Cali girl. I am from California from the the Bay Area. So that was the first time I ever stepped into a gym. And I read Laura Cohn's book on biceps, triceps, basically how to train, the ABC of training. And I was in the gym minding my own business, basically just to stay in shape. Because as an athlete, when you've been an athlete from the age of 11, you really don't know how to do anything else. So I, I wanted to stay in shape, number one. Number two, I didn't want to be like the rest of the females that I seen. Even through college, even through my high school years, the guys would say, oh, she has a nice ass. Or, oh, she has you know nice boobs. Oh, she looks good. I didn't want to be recognized for that. I wanted them to, if you're attracted to me, it's going to be for me. And being in a sport that is taboo, that means that you're really going to have to be confident in dating me. So that's the type of man that I, I wanted. And when I was training in the gym, Uh, a young man in the gym came up to me and he says, Hey, you know, my name is Irv. And he says, you know, you look like you have potential. And I rolled my eyes and I'm like, okay. He says, I bet in six months you couldn't get ready for a show. He says, I'll help you out. I'll be your training partner and I'll you know, do as much as I can for you. But I bet you, you couldn't get ready. That was the beginning of my career. It was on a bet that, yeah. And he was my training partner up until the uh, USA, up until I won the USA. When I won the USA and I turned pro, Irv said to me, you know, I can't take you any further. You know, he goes, you're you're now in another division. And I found another training partner. I never had a coach. You know, I know a lot of, you know, today, everybody has a coach. So wait a minute, you're telling me that you went to the Olympia seven times and you never had a coach. I never had a coach, but I can also say that was never at my best. Uh, Perhaps if I would have met someone that I thought was competent enough to really know my body and maneuver, then I would have had a coach, but I never met that person. It was all trial and error, and I can trial and error on my own. I'm not going to pay you to trial and error. So uh, yeah, I never had a coach. I had good friends that helped me with my nutrition, that helped me with my posing. 
Gail, a lady that I met when I first started, she took me under her wing and I learned my mandatories of posing. I met people along the way, uh, Jaguar, I don't know if you remember them, but I never paid for a suit in my life. They took me under their wing before I turned pro and they carried me all the way through for anything that I needed. So I've really been blessed in, you know, in the sport of meeting a lot of nice people. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a sponsor for several years and that was a BMS International German company who met me at the one of the Chicago shows. And again, you know, he approached me, his name was Jens, and he approached me and he said, you look like you have potential. He says, but you never come in shape. <laughs> and I, I just thought that was, you know, it was direct. He was right. I, I was never in my best shape. Um, I never was able to hit it on the nail. Sometimes I peaked too soon. Um, sometimes there was, they would always tell me you needed to be harder, which basically means you need to be full or you're carrying too much water. That I think was always my problem, it had nothing to do with my structure. But under his sponsorship, you know, I did elevate to another level. And gosh, I mean, I was able to travel and live abroad. And the sport has been really good to me. My only regret is that I never was at my best. You know, I mean, hey, you got to compete for basically 20 years when you added it all up, at least, or a little bit even more than that, which is just incredible and it just goes to show how much the industry has changed that you learned everything from a book where I don't know if I've talked to anyone on this podcast that learned <laughs> that learned about bodybuilding from a book now it's all these websites or it's just following people on Instagram and just how was what was even the bodybuilding culture like back in the 80s cuz that's just something that seems so foreign to people now just how people did the sport back then it you know it was uh, the kiss method keep it simple stupid so back then we had magazines you had Muscle and Fitness, a Muscle Mag, Iron Man. That's how we got all of our publicity. Um, the Mecca was the Mecca. You always wanted to go down to LA at least several times a month just to be seen in the gym because that's where you made a lot of connections. But the training style has not changed. It was very basic. Um, for example, for chest, inclines, dumbbell or barbell, flat flies, um, flat bench press. That was it. And, and, you know, cross cables that, that was your basic. So everything back then was basics. It was none of these fancy stuff, none of these fancy machines and it was dumbbell or barbell. So there wasn't as many machines as there is now. I don't think hammer was around back then. It may have just been coming in, but in pendulum, I don't ever remember seeing them, but it was extremely basic. The food, um, Again, was it was basic, your chicken, your beef, your rice, your vegetables. But back then you depleted. You depleted for seven days, you know, protein only. And you also um, didn't have any water for the last two days. You may have taken diuretics. So now they don't even do that. That's obsolete. They don't even do that anymore. There was definitely an off season. So in the off season, you would gain, you know, for women, I think the taboo was, you know, you don't want to gain any more than 10 or 15 pounds. For men, they would gain more. But I believe today there is no off season. You're trying to stay in condition and still gain that muscle mass so that when showtime comes, you don't have to starve or do something outrageous to get back in condition. So the, the mentality is different. And then you have so many things that you have access to, like social media. You can find almost anything you want on social media. Well, that wasn't around you know, back in the eighties, we had books. We had, I think Joe Weider had a book out, um, you know, about training. I think there were a couple of books. There is maybe that one, like I said, I got the book by Laura Combs where she had all of the exercises and she had a couple of, of diets. But the main thing is, you know, when you get to, you know, pre-contest or contest, you're going to have to deplete at least seven days and that's meat only. You can drink as much as you want. And then the last last two days or the last two and a half days, you're going to be sipping on water. And then there's going to come a point where you don't have any water. Yeah. And of course, the tanning bed, you know, you're, you're going to be in the tanning bed. You're going to try to get dark. You're trying to dry that, you know, the water out. Nowadays, uh, you really don't even need that because you're so precise in your nutrition and you have them spray paint you. Back then, we used ProTan where someone would paint you. So it's come a long way, definitely, like I said, a long way. But I think for women, there were more opportunities 
back when I was coming up. Because as I said before, um, I actually did get a sponsor and I lived abroad. You know, my guest appearances, <clears throat> they were abroad and I got paid good money for them, which I don't think the women have that opportunity today. I don't hear any of them saying, oh, I'm going to Africa for a guest appearance. I'm staying there for a week. Or, you know, I'm going to the twins, you know, Trinidad and Tobago, or I'm going to Hawaii for a guest appearance for a seminar. Very few women, I think, have that opportunity today. Now, I know um, Andrea Shaw probably has that, but she is Miss Olympia. But everybody else, let's say, out of the top 10, are they doing that? I would say probably not. They might be on social media. They might have be, in, you know, an influencer. That's fine and dandy. But the ability to go out and travel and say, you know what, I'm over here for a week and, you know, they're paying my hotel and I'm reaching these people that want to learn about, you know, bodybuilding. They want to learn how they can, you know, get themselves in shape. I don't think that's really being done like it was back then. So the opportunities for women aren't what they used to be. Um, Prize money, I think it's pretty consistent. It was a little better back then, but I think the Olympia prize money is still the same as it was when I retired. So, yeah. If you had social media back then, how do you think you would have used it? Because I always find that, I always ask my parents this too. It's like, if you were alive or if you were my age in the time of social media now, how do you think you would deal with it? You know what? Um, I'm pretty savvy. And I say that because when I had my first sponsor, uh, he was a businessman and he was very good at marketing. And um, I would have asked him, OK, this is where I'm at. Since we became partners in business at some point in time, I need to market myself, blah, 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 because he instilled in me, you know, you have to be marketable. And for the longest time, I was like, what are you talking about? I'm a female bodybuilder. I, they should be judging me on my muscle. And his concept was, yes, they should be, but you're looking at a total package. Everything from head to toe has to flow. And he says, right. And he was very honest. He says, right now, the way that you look, I wouldn't put you on my uh, on a package because you're not promotable. He says, so you need to change your look. You need to soften it up. You want to be promotable, not only to bodybuilders, but to everybody. And then you widen your street. So that was the first concept that I had. Okay. So, yes, when I'm, on, when I'm on stage, I'm on point. Muscularity and everything else, the face, the hair, the nails, all that. But when I'm doing a photo shoot, it's a totally softer, different look because I don't want to only reach bodybuilders. I want to reach everybody else as well. I want them to say, oh, my gosh, she looks very sexy. She's a pretty woman. Not she's a, you know, oh, she's a good looking bodybuilder. She's a good looking woman. And that will go not only for athletes, but maybe some woman, you know, older woman that says, oh, my gosh, she looks great. I wish I could look like her, you know. Um, so I would have used it definitely in that way. It would have been a stepping stone for um, marketing, but it would not have been difficult. Yeah, I, I just find it fascinating because, I mean, my parents struggle enough with social media as it is. So I just think it would be hilarious. And that's one of my scenarios was like, it would be hilarious just to see how people would adapt to that. But I think people like you, yeah, would be really, you know, quick to the adaptation. But I always love to talk genetics on this podcast because nobody's built the same. I could train just like someone else and eat just like them and do all their supplementations and I'm not going to end up looking just like them. And on top of that, everyone always has that one body part that really, really takes off that they don't have to train as much. And they have that one body part that just drags behind it. They have to train to oblivion. When you were getting started, what was one body part that really took off you? And what was one body part that you just had to drag behind? Well, when I got started, I was a stick. Remember, I was only 116 pounds when I got started. I was coming off of a gymnastics. I was 116 pounds. and I think I went up to like 125 when I first started training. So I was a stick. I didn't have any lats. I was kind of straight up and down, but I had nice legs because of gymnastics and track. I would say the upper body in the beginning. Uh, and you remember Sally, I think her name has changed, but Sandy Rinaldi was actually judged me from the very beginning back in the eighties. Right. <laughs> yeah. So she judged me and, um, I remember there was a conversation and the judges said, you know, your waist is long. So I had to adjust my suit because technically I didn't have any lats. So I looked like I had a long waist. So I would say the lat area, developing the back to make those lats come down longer and give an illusion that I actually had a wide back when it wasn't really that wide. That was my, yeah. 
how has the sport changed from when you first competed to when you retired? We're not even going to go to the sport now because it's changed so much even those 10 years. But just from 1985 to 2012, what was that like just to see the sport change in those 27 years? I think, well, you know, actually, I think the sport was pretty consistent. Okay. The only thing that, uh, you know, I think changed was the hands. I had Wayne D'Amelia as the president. Um, I think sometimes the quality of the shows wasn't as good. I think they added more classes because... Uh, first they had the, the middleweight, they had a lightweight, a middleweight and a heavyweight. This was in the pro division. And for some of the classes, like even the, in the Olympia at one time, they had a, a middleweight and a heavyweight, they had divisions. And as I retired, there was no more divisions. It was all in one. So someone that's five, two, I'm five, three, but someone that's short, I'm going to go against a five, seven, five, eight. If I step on stage at 150 pounds, the girl next to me is 175. It doesn't matter. I need to be in damn good shape. But back in the day, I would be in a class with women my size and my weight, which is fairer to judge, you know, because that was a, a complaint that a lot of the girls had is this girl, you know, she's an Amazon standing next to me. How are you going to even notice me, you know, when I'm short and everybody else is five, six and above? So in that sense, it's changed. Like I said, it's changed that way. I think there were maybe more shows back then. And for every show that I did, it was you were invited to the show and the athlete never paid their way. You never paid your way to a show. So now. Why did they ever get rid of that? That sounds like a great deal. You know, I, I don't know. Um, I think now you pay, you know, I did pay my way to my last two shows, you know, the Tampa and the Chicago. But back in the day, I didn't pay my way to any of the shows. The International was always invitational. So they paid your way. The Olympia, they paid your way to the, uh, you know, Olympia. The Jantana, she paid your way. You know, it was selective, but, you know, you put in your, you know, your application and your resume or why you want to do the show and you get invited. But you don't, that doesn't come out of your pocket. So it's changed in that sense. There's more money going out than coming in. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's, a, you know, I, I regret that because if you look at it as a business, I'm in business to make money, whether it's on stage or off the stage. But I definitely can't go in and be in the negative. If it takes me five thousand, let's say hypothetical, it takes me five thousand. I got to get my hair done, my nails and every, anything else that I do. If it takes me five thousand to prep for a show and I'm only going to make that money back if I'm in the top two, is that a good investment? You know, it's not for me. No. <laughs> right. So and I think that's why I look at it, you know, being in business, having businesses, you know, this is it's it's is a sport. Great. Yes, it is a great sport. It's a fun sport. It's one that requires discipline and focus and all those other things. So if you do it just because you love to do it, then that's fine. But when you look at it from a monetary business mind standpoint, OK, I just spent four thousand in contest prep. And I came back with $100. Now I got to do another show because I'm really trying to qualify for the Olympia. So by the time you get into the Olympia, you can be 6000 in the red. You know what I mean? And, and for the Olympia, is it what, the, the top five that get money? And if you're not in the top five, you're screwed. You basically have to win the Olympia to really, you know, make any decent amount of money on it too. And what is that mental strength that you get from this sport? How has that affected other areas of your life, like business wise? Because I've always had the notion that if you compete in a bodybuilding show, you can really do anything in life. And that, and that's true because you have a, a certain type of mentality because you're focused at the things that you need to do, and you just you don't give up. You know, if Plan A doesn't work, you have another Plan A. Yeah, um, you set your mind to it and, and it happens. I think for me, I've been in other sports and I have friends that are in other sports. I think bodybuilding is one of the hardest sports that there is. You know, and a lot of people say I couldn't do that sport because of the diet, because they don't have the mindset to stay on you know, a diet. When they want to go out and drink beer or hang out with their friends, that's what they want to do. But for this sport, this is a lifestyle. This is a true lifestyle. And because there's so many good women and good men, you can't afford to fall off to the wayside because now you got to play catch up. You know, so if you're always ready, you don't have to get ready. Yeah. And that goes with your, you know, your nutrition, your connections and, and everything else. So if you are popular, let's say you're uh, an influencer on Instagram or um, TikTok, or one, one of the social medias. 
you always want to be in condition. You always want to come up with something, you know, new. You always want to be an inspiration to other people because there are, in my opinion, uh, let's just stick to the ladies. Um, you know, as we get older, we definitely change. It's not as easy to stay in shape. And if you've ever noticed when you're out and about, most women have little bellies. If they can get rid of their bellies and have, what do they say? Oh, I wish I had a flat stomach. You know, I wish my butt, you know, wasn't so jiggly. But for most of their lives, they haven't done anything. Then they say, well, I've had babies and you're younger than me. No, I'm not younger than you. I've, you know, this, I've just stayed in shape. So if I can do it and I've had injuries and I've worked through all that, you can do it too. So if you're an, an inspiration, you're still going to get your followers. You're still going to get what you, you know, what you need. But I, I think now it's the way that you represent your package because each and every one of these ladies, she's a brand. And she has to present her brand to the point that other people want to be uh, something like her or she inspires them to follow, you know what I mean, to follow in her lead. What's it been like as well just to see the general public's reaction to women with muscle? It seems like it's gotten a lot more positive. Not saying that it was like totally negative back, you know, in the 80s and 90s, but it just seems like it has gotten a lot more accepting. What's that been like just to see that public shift sort of evolve? That's, that is quite um, rewarding. I can honestly say that when I was coming up, it was so negative. I would often be called a, or you, you know, you look like a, you look like a man. And I'm saying to myself, well, if I look like a man, that means you may not look that, you can't look that good. Oh, I always tell them what kind of men are you hanging out with then if that looks like a man. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, um, but I've had a lot of, of men um, say, you know, I love female bodybuilders. I want to date a female bodybuilder. And that's fine and dandy. And I'm glad that it's to that point because they're no longer afraid of what their friends may think of them. But at the end of the day, we are not um, your fantasy, so to speak. You know, something that you want to try, like you want to try out a hot dog. You say, oh, I'm going to go to this. So get, yeah, I'm going to get this alligator hot dog. I just want to try this out. That's not what we are. We're women. We, we have feelings. And we want to be looked at as a woman first. The package is just the package. It's just like a guy. You know, this is who he is. But and that's who I, I'm attracted to. I'm not attracted to him because he's a bodybuilder or, you know, he runs track and field or something like that. But I get a lot of that. And so that's kind of concerning uh, to me, because that's a, the first thing they say is I've always wanted to date a female bodybuilder. I'm like, why? Well, I love muscles. OK, did you all all of a sudden just start liking muscles? <laughs> Was this an epiphany that you just, you know, figured out? Well, and I always tell them, too, people won't realize it's a lot of work when you're dealing with someone that's de dedicated to a craft, too, where it's not. It's not all, it's not all fine and dandy because, you know, it's getting up early for workouts. It's always having your protein ready. I mean, it's a lot of hard work and preparation that goes into that look where a lot of people, especially if they just, you know, want the, want to be with someone just for the muscles. It's like, well, you know, that's 1% of the lifestyle basically that you really have to deal with. I mean, it's so much, so much stuff needs to go into this. And if you really want to date them, you have to be in it for the long haul too. And you have to be willing to put up with, you know, a diet brain and prep brain and all that other stuff. So it, there's just so much more into it that I think people don't understand, especially getting into it. But when you qualified for your first Olympia, I mean, what was that feeling like? Because for so many guests I talked to going to that Olympia, that's, you know, the Super Bowl, the world series, everything combined. So my first Olympia, um, let's see, I'd done it um, after my USA win. I was game to go to the Olympia that year, later that year. And I was told that I had to wait a year. And so I, I think there's a lot of stress that set in because I won the middleweight class at the USA. So I was 125 pounds. And when I was looking at the lineup for the Olympia, I had been following these girls all along. I'm like, well, cheesy, you know, they are big. And Irv and I were still talking. And I said, Irv, I don't know what to do. Should I gain some size or what do you think that I should do? And he goes, I think you, you're going to need to gain some size to stand next to those girls. So for me, it was nerve wracking because number one, I gained the size. My condition definitely wasn't as sharp as it was for, um, you know, the USA. Yes, it was a bigger package, but it wasn't as sharp, but it was still, um, I want to say it's a undescribable feeling because now you're on stage with these women that you've always seen in the magazines, like Laura Carval and um, some of the, so the the other ones that have been on magazine covers, that you open up the magazine, you see them training, her and Chris Aceto, and, and you're going down to L.A., and when you're in the gym, you see everybody that's somebody, 
and you know, there she is standing next to you and you're sizing her up and you're like, oh my gosh, this is a seasoned, you know, woman, I'm up here with all these seasoned people. Um, even with Sharon Bruno, I think she was new at that time as well. But um, it was it was nerve it was more nerve wracking because you know that you have to be on this is the best of the best of the best, you know. But also there was a it, you know I felt very blessed and fortunate to be there because there are so many women that I knew that were climbing up the ladder that had not qualified or were still trying to get their pro card. And I mean, you were starting during the reign of Linda Murray when she had her, you know, yes. dominant run. Was that nerve wracking at all to step on the stage with her? Because I imagine, because one time when I was pitching, I mean, I pitched against a guy who was playing in the major leagues now in high school, right. and it, him going to play, I was like, okay, this is not even fair. So, what was that like going with her? Because she had an unbeatable package, really. So, what was that experience like having to step on stage against her? So my thing, you know, when I look, because you get a list. Right. Once you get, you know, um, once they tell you, OK, you've been invited, you know, and they call you and you get your tickets, you get a list of all the girls that are going to be there. It's always the same girls. And I'm like, shit. OK, well, I already know <laughs> who took first. So um, and I'm like, OK, she's probably going to be in the top three. She's probably going to be in the top three. <sighs> <laughs> so that was yeah. So that was um that was always like that. Okay, what do I need to do, you know, to come in um, so that I'm in that group? And like I said, they were dry. They were striated. Uh, not everyone had a good package. Like I said, Linda, she had the package, period. That is just it. She had the package. Not only did she have the package, um, she's gorgeous. Yeah. She's, you know, she is very easy on the eyes and she's promotable. So that is that is a Miss Olympia because she has everything that you need to step outside of the bodybuilding and uh, promote herself to the public, not the bodybuilding, but the public. And and, that, and she's a good spokesperson. And that's what you want. So it's like, well, shit, well, I might as well just sit down and, and you know, uh, because she's definitely going to be, you know, the Miss Olympia because there was no one else coming up at that time that I felt would knock her off. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing with Andrea Shaw today where people are just right. just like, how do we even compete against that? It's it's kind of like with Iris Kyle, too, where you just wait for them to retire, basically. You're just like, if I can just still stay relevant until they retire, then I might have my shot. No offense to the people competing, obviously, but it's like, that's just that's just how it's been. But, I mean, you retired in 1998. What was the reason for that? And then you came back four years later. What was that hiatus like for you? So my mom was uh, sick. She had been diagnosed with... Um metastatic cancer uh, started in the lungs and it went to her brain and they gave her six months. So it is tradition in our family that when we have a member, a family member that's sick, they are our priority. Same and, here. Yeah. And bodybuilding for me, it will be there next year. it will be there the year after. But if my mom is leaving, I need to spend as much quality time with her as I can. So that time there was spent with my mom until her you know, departure. And you know, breaking up with, uh, you know, boyfriends who weren't supportive. So there was a lot of growing at that um, stage, but just getting used to, you know, now I don't have a mom, you know, and I, I know some of my friends are like, Oh God, you know, me and my mom went shopping. We did this and we did that. So there was like, you know, I don't even have my mom to do that anymore. You know? So I did miss bodybuilding. I did miss being on stage and it was a distraction from everything else. So when I was mentally ready after my mom had been buried and I took some time to figure out, you know, me and heal from her departure and realize that, you know, she's not coming back. You know, um, it's just you and your brother. And I lost my brother shortly after. So, yeah. So it was I was and it's like, hey, now it's just me, you know. Uh, so that took a lot. It took a lot to to get used to. And, you know, my mind had to be in the right place because I didn't want to come back and do something half, you know, because I knew I had been gone. And when you're gone for so long, they don't know what to expect, but they don't expect you to be on point when you come back into the sport. So if you're gone five or six years, they're like, okay, we know what she left like, but what is she going to be? She's older now. She may not have more of the, the muscle that she did before. She's going to be able to come back and shave, blah, blah, blah. So, um, you know, I wanted to come back. I wanted to show myself that I could still be relevant in the sport, that I can still um, be competitive in the sport. So after my mental state was where it should be, I came back. 
Well, I'm sorry for that. I mean, I lost both grandparents within six months, but that's not like immediate, immediate family. But yeah, that's, that's, that's just terrible. And I mean, you mentioned that throughout all of your shows, you never really came in, you know, the way that you wanted to for a lot of the shows. In hindsight, looking back, do you know why now? Or do you have like an idea of what you would have done different had you had the chance again? So not, I, not to be the dev, not to be the guy being like, oh, hey, you know, like, do you ever think about because I think about it. I, like I said, I was injured. I think about that stuff quite a bit. So, yeah. How do you deal with that? So. For one, I wasn't I was not a good dieter. And for most people, when you speak with them, they're like, you know, I do personal training. I'm in the gym. Blah, blah, blah. I didn't do personal training. I had two jobs. You know, one was UPS and the other one was FedEx. I just got to interrupt you because I worked as a, I was the director of airline shipping for five years at UPS. So, yeah. Okay. So when, so when I started, um, I was in college, but I was working the night shift at UPS, unloading those planes. Okay. And um, I've always had a job through this whole career, except for my sponsorship. I've always had a job. So now you're looking and I'm on my own now. I can't go back to mom and say, mom, you know, I need help with this or that, you know, my father was in Seattle and we were distant, but he was there. Uh, so it was like, okay, I got to get out and grind. I got bills that need to be paid, right? I wasn't living on my own. I was living with a roommate. Um, and I had a significant other that was insignificant, but um, so there was a lot of stress there, you know, to, to, you know, to work uh, a full-time job, to train, to try to get your tanning in, to get your posing in and all those other things. And I would stress and I would def I would have my malt balls and M&Ms. So that was my that was my relief. And through most of my career. And you're telling me you still look that good even on mothballs and M&Ms? I like I said, even on yeah, on mothballs, I that I didn't I never had a clean diet, if that makes sense. I never had a diet like nowadays, um, you know, I speak to some of the male competitors and they're like, no, this is what I eat. I'm like, well, that's how you look so good. He goes, Yes, I look good like this because I eat like this. Right. I never did that. You know, I, I'm not a beer drinker. I don't drink and I don't smoke. But my thing was malt balls and M&Ms. That was that was my go to. And it was my go to through most of my career. And then, like I said, when I had significant others who weren't significant, um, just that whole I, idea, you know, of, it's a, a volatile relationship. You know, you're up, you're down. It's not support. They're supportive one minute. The next minute, they're not supportive. So that's a lot to do when you're getting ready for a show. And I'm not saying I had that through my whole career, but through some of the shows that really mattered, it was there. But like I said, most of the time, it was not really being able to be focused solely on the show because there are so many other things going on. And that is something that I've heard, you know, dozens of times from people. Hang on. I'm just going to go get my, I know the sun's right in my face. I'm just going to close my window real quick. Okay. There we go. There we go. Much, much better. I was going to say like, and plus it just shows how pale I am too, whenever the sun can just get directly off me too. So th this is a much better look, but I do got to say like, yeah, I've heard so many times from people how you need to have everything mentally done before you can even think about competing in the first place. And if your brain scramble at all, that really is a, a, a big issue, but let's fast forward now to 2012. What was your decision to hang it up and how has it been like since then? Cause obviously we can tell you're still in incredible shape. So how, first of all, how have you managed that? And then, yeah, what was your decision behind hanging it up in 2012? So in 2012, I decided to hang it up because for whatever reason, my body wasn't changing like I wanted it to. And I felt it, it was just tired. It was just tired of competing for such a long time, show after show. And then some of the shows, like I said, you're contracted to do some of those shows. So mentally, if I wasn't ready, it didn't matter because I've signed the contract. So I got to go. Right. So um, after that, I just said, you know what? I'm done. Um, I was an officer at that time, not a police officer. I don't work with people. Um <laughs> I was an animal uh, animal control officer, and you know I was doing that um, training, uh, taking care of the animals that I have. And I did I have a second eye? Yes. Um, for the Jantana, I had a second eye that was you know uh, Tyler who had worked with me you know before he helped me win the Jantana and helped me win one of my other shows. But it just wasn't what I wanted. So, you know, for me, if I'm no longer excelling and doing the things that I feel that I should be able to, to do in the sport, then I'm going to step down. I don't do, you know, it's no sense in going into a show if you're not going to be in the winner's circle. 
that's your full your goal, you know. But if I go to two shows and I think that I look good, and you know, looking back, yes, I was still holding water. I need to be tighter. There are a lot of things that need to be brought up. Um, I would have probably not done the show, but there's a like I said, when you're a competitor, you know, that's what you are. But I had decided, you know, after this, I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to um, do something else. The opportunities wasn't what it used to be. And, you know, I wanted to kind of do some, you know, some other things. I wanted to give my body a rest. Um, I went, you know, back to working, always trained. Uh, you know, I still always trained. I just don't step We can stage. tell. We can tell. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, you know, I love animals. I've always loved animals. I've had animals since the age. Um, I think when I was younger, I just don't remember the dog we had. But my first job was taking care of my neighbor's dogs and I would walk them and bathe them and they were shepherds and I've always loved animals. I think they're very therapeutic for me. And when I was working as an animal control officer, because I did that in California and I also did that here, you know, I, I noticed that there were so many old animals being brought into the shelter and surrendered. And I would always ask, you know, one of the other officers, why did they surrender this poodle? Oh, because they don't want it anymore because it's old. I said, to the, I, you know, I say, are you serious? First of all, those people should be like put in jail because that's just that but nothing we, makes me angrier. Yeah, we had a we had a lot of that. So I wanted to open up a nonprofit that specifically caters to your geriatric dogs, cats, um, dogs, cats, horses, whatever the animal may be. And this is a place where they can live out the remainder of their lives, and then when they depart. You know, they would be buried or either cremated with the other ones. So that's what I um, have been working on. That's what I've been doing. I just recently retired um, from the animal control um, industry. And I run a small, you know, nonprofit here. Janine Lankowski is my partner in it. And we have about 13 animals now. Um, some of, you know, passed. And, you know, some are still here. But that's what I wanted to focus on is, you know, for those animals that people just throw away because maybe they need diapers or they, you know, they're blind or they have dementia, that, you know, they can come here and and, and live and they can get that one-on-one -on -one care. So I, I do that um, also. I also actually had a, a pretty bad accident here on the property. Uh, one of my pigs, we have pot belly pigs here. Oh. So one of the pot bellies got out. I didn't know she had got out. She was new and she had gotten out and I had let the dogs out and I heard her. Wait, so you were the person who let the dogs out. I let the dogs out. You're right. <laughs> I let the dogs out. And so I, I heard her scream and I, ran, I, I, and I just seen my dogs surrounding her, you know, um, and they're big dogs, you know, pit bull, Neapolitan Mastiff and a Great Dane. Okay. So, right, surrounding this, uh, you know, this new pig that we got. And so I went running over and, you know, I don't know what happened, Ryan, but I hit the ground. I fell and I tried to get back up and I couldn't. And I crawled over. I got them separated. Everybody was OK. But I called Janine and I said, Janine, you know, I think I just sprained my knee. I need you to come up because I got errands to do and I can't drive. And so she says, I'll, you know, I'll be on my way. Turned out, Ryan, I actually fractured my femur, tore my ACL, and I sustained nerve damage to the perineal. I couldn't even walk. I had the drop foot. If you know what drop foot is. Yeah. Yeah. So I had the drop foot. So I ended up out for a whole year. Yeah. And I still, like I said, I, I still don't have an ACL. I'm kind of waiting on that. I mean, my surgeon's ready. I've just, you know, after you're out a year and, and you know, you're hobbling around um, and I'm just getting back with my training It's just getting good now. You know, it's almost at it's at 80 percent. I mean, do I really want to go back under and get this done? So, you know, in one sense, I've been recovering. I've been enjoying the lifestyle of my you know, animals, uh, enjoying, you know, retirement. Uh, yes, I am looking for something else because I'm bored now. You know, I'm just here. Um but enjoying the training and for the first time, I can take my time in the gym. I, I, I'm not looking at my watch saying, okay, I only have 40 minutes in this gym. Because when I was working, you know, I worked 11, 12 hours a day. And then I did a night shift from 6 to 8 a.m. And it'll be like, okay, I, I only have like 30 minutes to get in here. And technically, you know, 
yes, you can do some things in 30 minutes, maybe a body part. Uh, you keep it to the basics, maybe two body parts, but it's not really intense training. So everything was rushed. So this is the first time that I, I'm not rushing. You know, I'm actually enjoying my training. I'm enjoying, you know, I still get up in the, in the morning. I do my chores and, and I enjoy the animals. Um, you know, I'm enjoying this, you know, interview. Ordinarily, I wouldn't have time for the interview because I only have 10 minutes and then I got to do something else. So I, it's been keeping me busy. Um, have I been asked if I'm going to return to the stage? You know, I, I have. Um, someone has put a bet in front of me. You know, you you know, wiggle. That's how you got started too. <laughs> you know, when you wiggle a carrot, I, like I said, I, I don't know. But I will say if I was to come back, everything would have to be right. And I can also say that um, I no longer need those malt balls and M&Ms. Hey, I mean, it's so what finally was the catalyst between not needing them now? What what changed? Me. It, it, it's me. It's uh, knowing myself more, being able to uh, deal with the stresses. And I don't have those stresses. You know, I don't have those stresses. The people that I have in my life, we're all a positive energy on the same page. And so by being more mature, if I see someone coming to my life that's going to be a negative, I shut the door. You got to go to the left. You can't come to the right. You know, you can't eat at my Christmas table. So I keep those people, you know, out of my out of my life. And I think as we mature, we become smarter. And then there's more things that we aren't going to accept and aren't going to deal with. So for me, those are that's where I'm at now. I know what I want, you know, as a partner in my life. I know what I'm not going to accept. So if you don't have the, the qualities that I'm looking for, I'm not going to waver. And the same as vice versa. So this is what I need to, you know, to come into the show the way that I think I should come into the show, looking at the competitors. And if I don't feel that I can do that, then it's not going to happen because you're looking at expenses and you, I'm not paying my damn money to go into the show. Now, if you want to sponsor me, you know what I'm saying? That's fine. But I'm not paying 4,000 to get ready for a show because now it's a business. And I look at things as business. I want to keep more money in my pocket instead of out of my pocket. You know, I, do I have 4,000 just to throw away on a contest prep suits and everything else? No, I don't. That 4,000, can go into this, you know, nonprofit. It can build me a new pig house. It can build me, you know what I mean? Some other things that the animals need um, because, you know, with the horses, they're expensive. You know, even my little hedgehog, she, I mean, you know, she has chronic ear problems, so she has to go, but um, it's not cheap to run a nonprofit, even though it's uh, by donations only, but sometimes we don't get the donations we need. So it has to come from somewhere, but uh, is it out of, of the park. It's not out of the park. It depends on if everything lines up the way that it should. And I think for me too, I still have, a, you know, an ego that, you know, I wonder if I can, you know, do that again. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to embarrass myself by any means by people saying, oh, she should have just stayed out of the sport, you know. Uh, and I think the the people that I have around me would say, okay, girl, no, you just need to sit down and do what you're doing. Um, or like I said, uh, you know, I've been asked several times and I've actually already have a sponsor wow. you know yeah if you it's like you know if you come back i will pay for everything i will make sure you have everything that you need so i haven't like i said i haven't accepted it um right now like i said i'm just getting back to 80 percent of my training and i, I want to reach you know 100 percent. make sure everything is really really good to go and see where you know i, I end up at you know, because like I said, a lot of things have changed in the sport. Well, just tiny tangent here. I think that caring for animals is one of the most noble things someone can do. And where can people donate? Because I'd love to help spread the word. And if anyone wants to donate to your, to your cause. Yeah, it's, um, we have an Instagram, okay. Jackpot's Animal Refuge. We have an Instagram. They can donate to the Instagram. It's linked to um, the PayPal. Uh, they can go there and um, they can see some of the clips that we've done about, you know, some of the animals we've, we've lost um, are, I don't want to, I don't know if you call them a martyr, that the Jackpot's Animal Refuge was uh, named after a 36-year-old Arabian horse. And that was my first horse that I ever had that through business, right, through the business and through bodybuilding, I was able to afford a horse, which I could never do before. And I had, his name is JP, I had him for over 20 years. He was my he was my boy for 20 years and we traveled abroad together. 
And he finally passed away at 36. So that was the the catalyst that says, you know what? Uh, I'm going to open up something in his name. Because I, I do know, Ryan, that as he got older, people would tell me, why don't you just put him out on pasture somewhere? You know, um, and I'm like, okay, if I put him out on pasture and he colics on pasture, there's no one that's going to be there for him. And I said, you know, I've had this horse for over 20 years. And just because he's old, I'm not going to throw him away on a pasture. He's going to remain with me. You know, I'm going to find some property. He's going to be put on that property. And I'm going to make sure that he has what he needs until he passes away. And I said, you know, this horse, he was my first horse. He's never thrown me off. He's never kicked at me. You know, I've fallen off, you know, because I put the saddle on loose. I've fallen off and, you know, rolled under him and everything else. I said, he has been a good horse to me. And, um, you know, when he passed, it was definitely like losing, you know, part of me because 20 years is a long time to have a companion. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'll leave a link down below for people who want to donate. And I highly encourage people to do so. I mean, it's such a noble cause. And But when you stopped competing, how did you do with the mental effect of, you know, you identify as a bodybuilder for a lot of times for people. And then you also have that look and you look incredible. You still look incredible this day, but like there's a difference between the bodybuilding look and the look when you're not competing. How did you deal with that mentally where you weren't as big as you were? Cause you get, you just get so used to seeing yourself look like that. How'd you deal with that? It, you know, it was hard. It, it was definitely hard because, you know, because we look at ourselves all the time in the mirror and we turn to the side, we turn to the other side, we have the mirror and we look in the back to see if our glutes are still there. We still have separation in the back. Uh, and it was getting smaller and it was getting smaller. And I just came to the realization, hey, I'm not on stage anymore. My main goal now is to stay in good condition. You know, if I, you know, um, I'm older now, I keep my abs uh, and just be a good conditioned athlete. And, and it, it was definitely hard at first because the uh, separation, the thickness and all that other stuff that comes along with, you know, years of training, it, it does get small. And you can, you can see that like in some of the men, you can see that in Jay Cutler, you can see that in Ronnie Coleman, you can see that in Kevin LeBron, you can see that in all of the guys that are competing, you do, um, you know, you do get smaller. But if I ever went back on stage or started training, you know, hard again, there's muscle memory. And, and you know, it's going to come back. So I think that's how I dealt with it is this is a temporary shell for me. This is a, you know, a, a new chapter. I'm letting my body rest from over 20 plus years of banging, it, you know, banging it and beating it up. Uh, I'm letting it recover from all the injuries that, you know, I have. And it is muscle memory. So if I choose to get back into the gym and hit it hard again, everything is going to come back to the way that it was. It may take me a little longer, but the muscle never, it never forgets. It is who you are, and and uh, it, it's just like riding a bike. You know, I haven't been on the bike since I was a little kid, but I know how to ride one. Yep. Yeah, same thing. What are your thoughts on bodybuilding now? Because even since you retired, the sport has you know changed completely. Even in the five years that I've been doing this podcast, the sport has changed drastically. But what are your thoughts on the current state of, especially the female side of bodybuilding? I you know I, I wish that women had more opportunities. You know because we are professional athletes. We don't have any insurance coverage. We don't have any com uh, camaraderie. You know, if so, let, and we didn't have that back in my day either. So we knew that we should have been treated better. We knew that there are certain things that we needed in the back that we needed to have. We need to have good food in the back. We need to have water. We need to have these weights, so on and so forth. Um, well, don't do the show unless they're going to treat you like you need to be treated. But on the flip side, it's like, oh, no, I can't do that because I don't want to be blackballed or I need this money. Well, who says you're going to win anyway? You know, really? So I, I wish there was more camaraderie. Um, and, and then, like I said, now with female bodybuilding, sometimes I feel that they can take it or leave it. I think if it wasn't for the wings of strength, there wouldn't really be any more female bodybuilding, even though it is, you know, it is very popular. And, you know, they add a bikini and, and physique and physique is almost looking like mini bodybuilders. I mean, I talk to figure competitors now and it's basically what, how physique was when I started. And it's like that for every division. Bikini is basically figure now. And it's, it's, right. it's interesting to see what it's even going to be at in the next five to 10 years if they just keep going at it. Because I mean, people, there's a physical limit. People can't get bigger and bigger for forever. Right. So, yeah. And, and so that's what they did last time with, you know, when the bodybuilders got too big, they said, Hey, you guys are getting too big. You need to you know tone it down a little bit, but they still kept rewarding the bigger bodybuilders. So it's like, okay, he tells us to tone it down, but then the bigger bodybuilders still, still won. I think there's still some confusion 
Uh, what I would like to see is for the women to have more opportunity to be more uh, camaraderie. Uh, there used to be, and I don't know if there is now, a women's representative where every year at the um, international, we had a meeting and we would go over things that we felt needed to be changed. And Betty Parisio was um, the spokesperson at that time and Chicarilla was for the men. But I, I found that to be, um, you know, really enlightening because it was our only opportunity to, that we all got together and talked about our concerns. Now, you know, you have to have a strong leader to make things happen. You know, <laughs> that really didn't happen, but I, I think um, that was, it was good to see that, but the opportunities, okay, I, I do a show. So after I do a show, then what, you know, let's say I do a show and I look really good. You know, I'm not in the money, but I, I look really good. All right. Well, I just lost $5,000. Yes. My choice to lose that money. And let's say I'm not that popular on Instagram. Okay. How can I make that, you know, what opportunities can I do to make that money back? Can, is there a promoter in maybe another country that wants a female bodybuilder, you know, to come speak to the other women about health and fitness, those things are, you know, I mean, those things aren't available. And back in my, you know, back in my day, they would be promoted from around the world that would reach out because in the magazines, after you did your interview, they had your contact information. That's how I got a lot of my um, work is that the promoters would contact me and say, Hey, we'd like you to come here and talk about fitness and, and pose and blah, blah, blah. So I think now it'll probably be Instagram, you know, but how do you actually do that? Because like I said, this is a big world. Bodybuilding is very popular. Fitness is very popular. And if the, and if you're promotable, like I said, you have to take yourself out of that bodybuilding look because you're only going to look that way on stage anyway, maybe two or three days after, and then you're going to get a softer look and fill out and do those things. But, um, you know, I, I would say more opportunities for you know the women that they didn't you know that they don't have in my opinion and i know a lot of women love the sport that's why they do it is because they love the sport but you got to live yeah you know you, you got to live and i i don't know um, i haven't seen any numbers on how much they actually make you know in in the sport i mean from um what they charge the promoter i know they charge so much money for the cards i think like 200 400 bucks you know, for the cards. And then from what I understand, um, let's say if I did open and I want to do masters, you know, I have to pay another fee. Why? You know, so, that, so I'm looking at, okay, how much money do you guys actually make? And then how much money are you actually putting back into the sport so that this sport can really grow? You know what I mean? And so that everyone that competes in the sport has the opportunity to do uh, you know, something else because not everybody is business savvy. Some people know what they know, which is being a coach training. They can talk to you about nutrition, but they may not know how to put it all together and say, you know, I'm going to start my own business. A lot of people aren't, you know, because if they were savvy, they would do it. Yeah. So, um, you know, for today, that's, you know, that's what I see as far as the competitors, they're in really good condition. And I'm looking at the Olympia competitors. You know, that's what I'm looking at as the Olympia competitors. Uh, the condition is much better, I think, than when I was competing. I would say um, Iris still fits in that category. Kim Chavesky still fits in that category. Um, Linda still fits in that category. I think Andrea's, you know, always in good shape. I've seen her at the Olympia. She looked great. I, I actually like Angela Yale. You know, she's, you know, my favorite. But uh, the conditioning is good. They don't really leave any stone unturned. And they're consistent. No, it's, and the consistency is honestly one of the biggest parts. And speaking of consistency, how have your workouts changed now that you're just not training for bodybuilding? Do you do different training techniques or how do you still maintain this look while not competing? You know, the mentality is the same. The mentality never changed. And now, like I said, uh, I have a, a carrot in front of me, right? So technically uh, when uh, I was um, chubby, you know, I had a, um, a muffin top before like last year, let's say five months out from the Olympia. I, you know, I had a muffin top, um, you know, I was injured. I wasn't, you know, it's hard to train when you can't really bend your leg or when you're hobbling along and you have to have, I have to wear a boot for several months to walk. And, uh, you know, as far as the upper body, I, I had um, some spurs in my shoulders, you know, so I can only do certain exercises. So everything that I did seemed to hurt. 
So I, you know, I was down to like 15 pounds of curls and uh, when it went to the machine, 15 pounds for overhead presses. Right. So that was, a, you know, it, it was very depressing. And I remember talking to my surgeon and I said, you know, am I ever going to be the way that I used to be? And he goes, you know, that's going to be up to you. You know, I said, well, what about my, you know, my foot and me being able to walk again? He says, you have five inches of nerve damage. He says, it takes time for that to heal. And he says, and it heals very slowly. He says, I, he goes, I'm going to try to get you as close to 100% as possible because I can't guarantee it, but you should be able to walk again. And I'm like, all right. So I'm at 90%. And he says, 90% is about the best that we're going to do. So I don't need my boot anymore. Um, you know, I can squat. You know, um, I can do those things. So I'm, you know, I'm happy that I can do those things. But the, like I said, now that I feel better, that my injuries, you know, have healed, now my psyche or my mindset is, is much better. So now I can go into the gym and say, okay, you know, let's do this. Now that I lost my muffin top, right, and I have abs and, and I have separation. So the, the way that I look at myself now is definitely much better. And that was on a bet. Five hours from the Olympia, someone says, you know what? I bet you you can't, you know, I give you $1,000, he said, if you can get in shape, uh, you know, prior to the Olympia. I said, you're on. So, um, and, and since I've gotten in there, like I said, those malt balls, M&Ms, gone. You know, because I don't want to go back to that. You know, I like the way that I look now, and I don't want to go backwards. So, um, and I always want to, like I said, I don't want to have to get ready like I had to before because five months of getting, you know, it was, you know, it's like five months and I'm like, God, it's taking so long for it. You know, I still got a little muffin top. Why is this taking so long? And I, and I realized I'm like, geez, you know, I'm not 25 or 26 anymore. And so it's going to take a little long, but I don't want to be in that position anymore. And I can't inspire, inspire somebody else, you know, telling them, oh, you need to do this. You need to do that. And, you know, I got my belly hanging over, you know what I mean? My pants. It's just not cool. So, uh, but now I can at least say, you know what? I was out of shape and I was, I had cellulite on my legs. So I know I was out of shape. So if I can get myself in shape, there's no excuse why you can't. And I was injured getting back in shape after, you know, things started to move forward. So it is definitely, like I said, possible, but the mentality never changed. The ego was definitely hurt. Um, definitely the depression, but the bodybuilding part of me, that is who I am. That's who I will always be. That's never changed. And plus, like with these animals, I got to, you know, this is almost three acres. I don't have a little, you know, a little car that I drive around and I got to walk everywhere. You know, so, you know, I don't have an option. And if you were to look back on your bodybuilding career, what would be your number one highlight that you would look back most fondly on? There's a couple, I, you know, definitely the USA, because I didn't think that I was going to win that. Uh, Denise Rakowski was the favorite, you know, because she, uh, she had been around much longer than me. And here was, I was this, you know, this girl uh, coming in. And you can tell, uh, if you look at my pictures, um, you know, I had a ponytail. And most of the girls had their makeup and their hair done. I didn't have any of that. You know, I had a little ponytail and I was just raw, basically. Um, they played my wrong music, so I had to <laughs> do impromptu. Um, Maybe that. sabotage, we don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know. I gave him the tape, and that's not the tape that I gave him. But it would, like I said, it would be the USA, and I didn't have, at that time, I, I didn't know, uh, you know, what being a pro was all about, because that was never, this bodybuilding was never my goal. It wasn't my goal to be a bodybuilder. And, um, you know, after the USA, people were like, you know, there are, you know, a lot of people that never turn pro, blah, 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 blah. You're so lucky. Um, so that was definitely one of my highlights turning pro. And, you know, I think, like I said, you know, being at the Olympia, being at the Arnold's, those are all highlights. But I would have to say that, you know, turning, uh, you know, turning pro was probably one of the most exciting um, highlights because I, I, I didn't know that I was going to when they announced me, you know, the, the winner, because it had to be back then you had to win the overall to turn pro, you know, it wasn't your class. It was the overall. And, um, normally the heavyweight always wins, you know, and the, the overall. So it would have to be, yeah, that, 
Yeah, I mean, so many guests I talked to, that pro car is just the highlight of it. And before wrapping things up, I do got to say, like, I mentioned that I was sent a video of you one time where you had a pop can on your chest and you were balancing it. When you when you were in your prime, like, your chest was, in, I mean, it still is incredible, but, like, when you were in your prime, how much weight were you putting up? Because, good God, that, you were, it was massive. So when I was in my, um, when I was in my prime, I would say my heaviest, um, I prefer dumbbells over barbell. Okay. So my heaviest barbell, barbell, and that was maybe like for four reps, was 90. That's really not a lot because I think a lot of the women now, that's kind of average for, let's say, someone 5'7", five, 5'8", five, because they're weighing what? But barbell is like a little bit harder, though, too, than the, than the bar, though. So I'll give you credit for that, though, too. But the, but the barbell, I mean, the, but the dumbbell, you have more range of motion. You know, so that's why I like the, the dumbbells because of the range of motion. Um, and, I, you know, I've always people say, oh, you know, you must do a lot for your chest. No. Uh, some, I'll open up with the fly, depending on if it's an incline or a flat fly. And then I do incline bench press and a uh, flat bench, and that's it. That's that's all that I do for chess. And I, I know the picture that you're talking about. Um, and this just reminds me, I don't know if you've ever seen that commercial. Uh, when there's a guy, he has a battery. He says, knock it off my shoulder. I dare you. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what that re- reminds me of. And um, it was it was fun. I was over at my friend's house, and she goes, I'm going to you know, videotape you with this <laughs> on, on your chest. Like I told her, it's a neat party trick. I mean, I've never seen anything like that. So that's, you know, that's incredible. And, I mean, if if you were to get remembered, like, I don't know if there's really any bodybuilding historians, but if a bodybuilding historian were to, you know, talk about you, what would be – something that you'd like to be described as like with not saying that you're you're dead or anything like that but like when they if you're like have a plaque up for like nancy nancy lewis bodybuilder what would you like to be remembered by in the sport oh geez there's a lot of things um i you know i would say when you're looking at are you looking at the the total package not physical but you know um, personality things of that nature or just like like package. both kind of like how like when someone gets inducted into like the baseball hall of fame or something like that they also list like oh he was a great guy on top of being you know a great okay. girl. like they list everything about yeah so i would say you know nancy lewis known for her structure and her uh her chest and her ability her pec deck dancing because everybody you know <laughs> you know the, the pec deck dancing um but on, on top of that she was a very kind, loving person who loved animals and, um, you know, was honest and a, a lot of, uh, you know, and a lot of integrity. So when you speak of Nancy Lewis, you speak of a woman with integrity, uh, you know, someone that loves animals and has a great, greatest peck deck dance I've ever seen <laughs> and good structure. Well, I mean, yeah, that's, that's about as the description that I would come up with as well. But I, before we do wrap it up, I do got to ask, because you are really good friends with Janine Lankowski. How does she cheat with posing? Because she's the one guest that I've had on where like, she just does it naturally. She doesn't really need to practice as much. Do you, do you know anything behind the scenes of like how she rigs it? Because I don't think that that's natural for someone to be that good at posing. So how do you think that she's able to get away with just being that good of a poser just naturally? <laughs> well, Janine it naturally has rhythm. Yeah. She has rhythm. And she was a gymnast as well. So when you you put rhythm together and gymnastics, uh, like the the handstands, the splits, and things of that nature, uh, plus she feels the music. Some people just pose, but she connects with the music. And then I think because of her experience, she has the ability to connect with the audience and draw them into her posing. And not everybody has that. And you know, like I know, you can pose, you can be the best poser, but you're just posing. You know, the audience is watching you pose. They're not feeling what you're feeling. So she has that ability to do that. And like I said, she has rhythm. She's always going to be on the beat. And you've seen those bodybuilders. You're like, okay, is he posing? Is she posing to the music or is she just moving? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so yes. So that's how um, she does it. And, and I think it's, it is one of her gifts. You know, she doesn't have to think about it. She doesn't try hard to do it. It just happens. So that's her gift. Yeah, everyone's really, you know, blessed with something. And is there anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to before we wrap it up? Um, yeah, I'd like to shout out uh, to my girl. She's my bestie, Janine. Um, she's going to be coming back uh, this year. So I'm looking forward to seeing her on stage. Of course, you know, the refuge, Jet Pots Animal Refuge, um, all the ladies that uh, suggested that you contact me. Thank you very much uh, for your support and for you know, uh, seeing me, I'm, a lot of them call me the legend. I don't know why that is. I guess I've been around forever. Um, and, you know, I like to, you know, just shout out to um, Hottie, 
and let him know, you know, I really appreciate uh, that challenge that he gave me because that's why I am where I am today. So, um, yeah, I just like to, you know, thank those people and wish them a great 2024. And we'll see them in 25. I mean, Nancy Lewis herself, everyone, it's just an absolute pleasure and delight to have you on and, you know, share your story. And I can't wait to have you on back again and just share some more. But I mean, it's, it's a delight talking to you and it's, you're definitely one of those guests where I was actually like preparing myself for and not just you know going through, she has her own Wikipedia page, everyone, which is the first for, for everyone here. But you know, Nancy, I cannot thank you enough for coming on. It was an absolute delight to talk to you. Well, thank you. And you know, Ryan, thank you for having me. I'm glad that we got the technical difficulties. Um, Again, everyone, my voice is not going to sound like it's on a microphone. And I know one of these guys is going to be like, Oh, it doesn't sound right. It's going to be okay. That's why, guys, I just got to point that out again, even though I did in the very beginning, because after doing these for five and a half years, Nancy, and you know this too, we're like, you do one thing wrong, you're going to get called yes. out on it. <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah. yeah. I, Nancy, I cannot thank you enough. It was just an absolute light. Everyone go and give her a follow. I'll leave a link to her organization down below as well, as, as, long as, her, as well as her as well. And I just look forward to talking to you again. And just, again, everyone, Nancy Lewis should take a bow. I mean, it's... It's just incredible to have you on. And again, I thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. And you know what? Um, have a great day. Take care of yourself. And hopefully we will reconnect and I can, you know, you can catch you up on new developments yeah. um, that have been going on. And perhaps, you never know, uh, might be back on the stage at 25. Absolutely. Well, we'll keep posted for that. And everyone, this is Ryan Johnson, DD on the Spot, signing off. Have a great day, everyone.